Welcome, Dr. Birju Vaishnav. Birju is a great friend of mine. He's an alumni from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. He's a PhD in theoretical physics. And his thesis, his thesis was the first one to look at um, gravitational waves from emanating from black holes, which eventually led to, you know, the, the LIGO discovery of the, of the black holes. So Birju worked on it like he was a path setter. And right now he's finishing his um, residency in, um, in uh, radiation oncology from Mayo Clinic. So welcome Birju. It's nice to have you on Physics of Pranayama. Mm-hmm. And I thought it's been it's been on my mind for many years now, so I'm going to uh, start sharing my screen so hopefully people can see what I'm talking about, and then we'll get to the questions. It's it's like a prelude to my question, Virju. So bear bear with me a minute. Can you can you share can you see this uh, screen? This yeah. is the book. <laughs> this is the book compiled by our mutual friend, Mr. Dinesh Kashikar who's also a graduate of the Indian Institute of Technology, this time Mumbai, or Bombay, I would say. And you know, in this book, uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar speaks about time. And what, and what in this book was fascinating is that there is this microscopic time divisions that people talk about, and they talk about some various like esoteric units, like so many pranas and so many tatparas and all this stuff. And, and it goes on and it goes on and on. So there's like the various ways of counting time and the meso, meso um, the scopic divisions in the astrology, all this kind of stuff. But what really caught my attention, Birju, is this thing, you know, the, the, the time dilation of Brahma to Kalpa, then Mahavatra, and then all this stuff. And this one is the highlight. This is my first question, you know, one Brahma year is 3.1 million, a trillion, 3.1 trillion Earth years, right? So my question to you, Birju, is this. What possible mechanisms exist in modern day physics to enable this time dilation between Brahma year and human year? One BY is 3.1 trillion HY. You know, this is my, it's always been fascinating to me. How does this happen? So, you know, the most of the text in that book, you know, who wrote that? You. I wrote that. And uh, (laughs) this was my question also. This was like when, so Kashi had compiled a bunch of documents and he had sent it uh, to Susanna Rawley. And we, you know, I was, Gurudev asked me to write this and he's like, I want it like a PhD thesis, chapter by chapter, systematic. And right. uh, so I, we had this question. And Susanna Rolly was of the opinion that, oh, this is, Susanna Rolly is a lawyer. She has been with uh, Art of Living for a long time. And she mm-hmm. was, at that point, she was with Gurudev for 20 years. And I was like one year into Art of Living. Uh, right, so, but you had a PhD in physics. And I did not. I was a, lawyer. a grad student. Okay, grad student, right. I was okay. still, I was, and Gurudev asked me, it's like, kabhi likha hai, PhD thesis, I said, Gurudev, abhi to chalu kiya hai. <laughs> so, so, but likhe ka, will you do it? I said, yes. So, uh, so that, that time, Susanna was like, uh, this is, there are all these divine beings, and Brahma, and all these things. I was like, there are no divine being, there's no person like that. Are you, how much you want to bet? Let's go and ask Gurudev. And we went and asked Gurudev, he was sitting in the other room and he was like, yeah, yeah, see, in the olden days, when they want to say anything is big, they would associate it with divinity. They would associate it with uh, Brahma or Narayana or something like that, Divya, like that. So it is a unit of time. So when they want to say 43, they would say Veda Rama. Veda, four Vedas, three Ramas. This was literally the example he gave. Veda Rama 43, four, three. So four Vedas, three Ramas. So Veda Rama, that's how they would. So it was a depiction rather than an actual, some, there is no bearded person. This was, he said this, there is no bearded Brahma sitting somewhere with so many years and this and that like that. So, but it's fascinating that they had conception of cycles of time. 
and they have various conceptions like the kali yuga and all this you know the dif different yugas also they have uh, in in the rugved there is one reference to five year yugas five year uh, which is which can be related to social cycles you know a society right. also generation also in 20 years generations change so the society changes so uh, there are various cycles of various types and this trillions of years is some sort of an astronomical cycle that all astronomy they inevitably they associated it with the divinities of different forms right uh, i see so the, so so in in my mind so now you've cleared up one thing that there is no such thing as a guy called brahma it's a concept which is just so what what is the big deal about the brahma time versus you know the 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 tri the triangles that kashi has written in the book he 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 depicts it he depicts it as a dilation he says one unit of this is so many million units these of are, that and one unit of that is so many million units of this what's the yeah. point of that so these are so that is the systematic that is the extent of see the depth of a civil depth of thought of a civilization can be measured by how uh, vast its imagination of the people of the philosophers is so these people this is like what 5000 years old or six, I, we don't have exact reference of when this uh, uh, division how long ago this was but uh, the at a time when earth was considered six or the universe was considered 6000 years old in rest of the world these people were talking about cycles of creation and dissolutions of suns and moons and stars and the universes and right. trillions of years cycles and right. so it is that imagination which which is to be noted like so this systematic division of 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 measurements of the time from very large units to very small units right. a mathematics that spans across a broad big range of scales that indicates right. a depth of uh, uh, yeah yeah acuity you know like sharpness right. so, so in my in my simple way from that it was that and and as gurudev also said uh, do these time intervals relate to anything concrete yeah and he said see uh, we don't know i said how did they measure some of the small there are like fractions of a microsecond mini you know very very small uh, uh, time intervals nimish there's a nimish and nimish, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. we're talking about nimish and all those things yeah it is a flash of a eyelid like you blink your eyelid that mm -hmm. much and fractions of that so i was like how did they measure this thing so gurudev is like we do not know that is not documented our job is not to speculate but to present what is been passed on what we know so far at least preserve that much that is what uh, we should do and right so in my simple minded understanding of how much ever physics i know i can think of two mechanisms so i in the in my typical left brain way i said maybe brahma is moving really fast in time and space right because of the relativistic dilation but the problem is birju that i cannot compute to 3.1 million i ran out of i ran out of decimal spaces i also did it in python i could not get to that it needs a he's almost at the speed of light at this kind of dilation right so then i said okay screw that then i said let me do another way like i i watched this movie called um, interstellar where these guys go onto the planet which is near a super gravitation source right and then time dilates for them so i said okay cool maybe brahma is a massive uh, a gravity field and then i did the other way of calculation and i still could not do this 3.1 trillion thing and i said dude i got to ask a physics guy like <laughs> so is this so virju what are the mechanisms in physics which allow allow time to dilate other than these two that i said are there any other mechanisms well so the the question I, i would rephrase the question as what does time in physics mean right like, but that's uh, going to be a separate talk virju on time <laughs> it's not for this one <laughs> all right so so okay so right 
but like, simple mindedly uh, in physics like so i'll i'll give you something very funny uh, example like when i was in grad school when i first learned about these things you know from third year physics or second year physics we had to do an experiment about uh, muons measuring the lifetime of muons so these muons these are funny objects they are a couple of very short life span you know if you generate it in the laboratory it will decay like that microseconds or something you know if you and if you uh, the ones which are generated in the atmosphere with the sun's rays you know the sun is constantly emitting uh, because of all the nuclear fusion reaction there is so much pressure and explosions so it's emitting ions so there are cosmic rays there are right. literally heavy heavy ions passing through us as we speak right so these muons are generated in the top layer of the earth's atmosphere when this heavy ions hit uh, they interact and these muons are pr- produced as a shower uh, mm-hmm. now it takes them several uh, a long time to come from there to here a few yeah several half lives right like, several half lives yeah it's about th- yeah many i forget the exact number now but mm-hmm. some every several half lives it takes it is like imagine an apple if you keep an apple of course an organic apple now these days this apple you can keep forever <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, imagine a real like an uh, untampered with apple which yeah. will decay in whatever a month or whatever uh, sometime imagine that apple surviving for years right right that is the time scale that this thing is generated in the mm-hmm. top of the earth's atmosphere it should not go more than a few feet but it lands up in the laboratory and you can measure and it it's almost said as close to the speed of light right and it challenges the very conception either these muons behave differently like you have different types of muons like the same muon if it is generated in the atmosphere mm-hmm. it has a different laws of physics versus if it is in a laboratory which is ridiculous because then for every room you will have a different law of physics then it yeah. makes no sense to have a law right it's like it behaves however it wants it's then there is no question of a law so right. if you, does the universe have a coherent uniform structure behind it if you say mm-hmm. if you assume that it does then the whole cha- the conception of what time is gets shaken up uh and those are the two extreme examples in this interstellar also that guy is like uh, oh we'll just go for 10 minutes and come back and then he comes and this guy is like oh it's been 5 years <laughs> like, yeah right 5 years i have been waiting for you so because and it is stunning in inter in interstellar it is stunning because i did not make the connection but when they see him in their spaceship back the guy is physically older and i said oh my god i totally missed the connection with the gravity it's amazing the way they have done it it is kip thorne was the producer kip thorne is my advisor's advisor uh, i mean the academic lineage of uh, kip thorne mm-hmm. and uh, he he was one of, he was the he, recipient of the nobel prize like he actually went and uh, received it for on behalf of all of us so the, he made it very accurate so those calculations are precise uh, in keeping with the einsteinian uh, relativity relativistic understanding that we believe so far we have good evidence to believe in that uh, that it is it is valid but i you know this muon story i also heard it and one guy he explained it if you if you apply the relativistic time corrections to the muons then they make total sense because they're moving so fast precisely predict it's like you can precisely. predict the lifetime and it will decay at that lifetime and it it, it will right. make it to the earth and it will even pass through and then it will decay right so will you i got to i want to come to my second question which is still uh, going on in that same book that i assigned to kashi but which was written by you which is a very so I mean, this is kashi was the, all the graphic artwork everything he did it so i mean which was a team effort right, right. but like right, right. so i got the opportunity to interact with gurudev and set the chapters and the material and choose what will be in it so that was my right. ashi compiled all the materials right so this is what there is a section in the book that uh, so my scanner is not working so i i took a photo just so that i could put it here 
you know it says the universe is calculated to be 1.97 billion years in 2002 then i did some research and here's what i found from space.com that the wmap estimate is 13.7 billion with an uncertainty of 59 million which is still not bad so my question is how did these guys if it was like you said, if it was not a real Brahma sitting somewhere and this dilation, etc., how did these guys come up with 1.97 billion, which is pretty bloody close to what we know from physics? You know, when when Einstein took the leap of faith, Galileo Galilean relativity, Galileo already kind of from Aristotle to Galileo was a big leap. Because uh, Aristotle believed in a fixed frame of reference, ether, and Galileo said that no, if you are moving in a ship, or if you are sitting on the earth, or if you are going in a plane, the same laws of motion apply. This was a big leap that Galileo made. And this was an intuitive leap. He did not go to many ships and did many experiments. But he was like, no, I have a feeling it's, the universe should be like that. Then it came to Einstein for four, five hundred years later. And then he also had this, at that, that time there was Michelson model and there was all this issue. So yeah. Einstein was like, okay, I would be, the universe has to be like this. Yeah. He proposed the principle of relativity, which said the laws of universe have to be like this. Somebody asked him later, they said, what if it was wrong? What, what if uh, your proposition was wrong? He said, I would feel sorry for God. <laughs> I would feel sorry for God. This kind of uh, operating from an intuitive, the point what I'm making is science pro progresses when such leaps, intuitive leaps happen or intuitive leaps of imagination. If there's imagination and then there's intuition and there is truth and, and there's a sound mathematical basis all of these things and experimental uh, validation, all of these things come together. In these people's case, they had, they did have the intuitive uh, and the imaginative and to some degree they had predictive experimenting astronomical uh, predictivity. They have, there's some evidence to suggest that they had, they had the understanding of gravity, inverse square law, things like that way back in the time. They could accurately predict many of the eclipses and many of the epicycles and there are many, many uh, dynamics that they could predict, which the uh, other astronomical models could not. Uh, so somehow they came to it and in, inevitably, I mean, this, uh, this was interwoven in the, uh, I mean, this is a result of the lifestyle which was interwoven in, in the in the daily routine of these people, which was through meditation, through pranayama, you have to do Gayatri mantra and all this. There was a whole routine which was specified. And there are specifically meditations which sharpen your intuition, sharpen your intellectual analytical capability, which you, you do certain type of meditations and it will, so there are certain type of meditations which will sharpen your memory. Like you can, at the same time, uh, average working memory can hold seven objects six to seven objects. Uh, right. There are shatavadhani, they can hold 100 objects. People, oh, wow. you can train to hold 100 objects. But this is special, like you have to train for it. Like it is a, not like a, you only do that, then they, that's the speciality. They are a shatavadhani. And then right. there are, so you memorize it, the books, they would read it once and they would, in 10 minutes, they can memorize the whole book. And that is all that, that's their, prof like they do that. That's their specialization. So it takes, it takes time to learn all these things. It's not comes for free, but there are, the point is they had developed empirical ways or uh, methods to uh, do these things, to develop these cognitive skills, cognitive capabilities, inner capabilities, by which the intuition, they could, uh, they could shaft, you know, like intuition is mixed or, you know, wheat and shaft. So they could separate the two things and say, okay, what, is probably correct and what is just imagination. And they used to call that the yoga maya. 
so they had mm-hmm. a very sharp way to discriminate analytically uh, rule out what is yeah. accurate and what is not accurate and that is fascinating and that is what all this meditation what gurudev has presented with us preserved for us to a great degree uh, it is to, to some of those techniques some of those idea or the the methods are what is presented to us Honestly. but it's fascinating that you say this because if you watch the movie sherlock holmes in there there is a scene where he says i'm going to go into my memory palace and oh. this is exactly what you're saying because he in his memory palace has a zillion things just organized and then yeah. he's walking through it yeah. you know when he's dealing with moriarty and all this uh, stuff he goes into his memory palace and this is brilliant because uh, you know i mean you 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 said that there are certain meditations that right i i knew the seven objects thing but yeah. i also knew that there is a meditation that lets you hold 100 but till you spoke to me now i did not connect it with this sherlock memory palace thing it it all makes sense now it it's quite amazing these are these are these are techniques i mean it's not like kriya or something but, it, but there are you have to do this is the basis and then on top of that you have to do like for example vedic uh, scriptures right when these people burnt down they, there were all this nalanda university and all this they wanted to burn it down or even alexander stein they wanted to burn it down so they said okay give us one night and then in one night they got it memorized like all these people they would just and they can recite the book backwards and forwards like can you imagine reciting i cannot imagine reciting even a paragraph backwards right right if you if, if you tell a paragraph and then you tell the paragraph reverse words semantically word by word reverse i cannot do that they the, these are called ganapathis in the, in the veda there's a ganapathi they can recite forward backward interspersed mixed they can and then those are the there is a cryptography in it like how do you ensure that it's the authentic my brother is a monk so he tells me all these things okay. so he <coughs> but does it cryptography there is a way to remember to to verify the accuracy of the transmission whether the person has remembered correctly or not to cross check it it's like the checksum you know it's like the checksum uh, thing when you're yeah. doing data transfer you have a check you have a parity bit something yeah. like a parity bit maybe they had they had algorithms they they are very sophisticated algorithm you know in fact i met professor rao who was who was the founder of uh, who created the lisp or one of those early languages uh in the 50s or some so and he he based it on aryabhatta's analysis of the vedic uh, uh cryptography like the first ai language it came from the ideas of these people so it is because they had developed the way of intuition how to refine the intuition that they had mastered it. which so is, is some... it because is it because sanskrit is a language where you can you can juxtapose words but the meaning of the sentence doesn't change right it's a it, it's one of those unique languages where you can move the order of the words around and the meaning is still unchanged is that is that the reason maybe i don't know maybe that is the reason i don't know there are many factors to it i don't know mm-hmm. like you can we can there are many many reasons many factors why this may happen one of them may be sanskrit was also designed by the same people same guys exactly right how did yeah. they design that so yeah. you know, this is it's a wonder it's more of a wonder it is more of a wonder that's right for sure yeah they the documents were not preserved through all the in onslaughts civilizational onslaughts the documentation has not preserved itself so we can only yeah. guess you know somehow mm-hmm. So if you have some uh, few more minutes please you I'd like to get your thoughts on um, you know these um, these length scales they've always troubled me that you know planck when he figured out that the radiation from a furnace would be infinite energy unless you quantize it right so he chopped it down but he he had to chop it down to a scale of 10 to the minus 34 type thing before it all made sense 
and you and i had a discussion on this and you said forget 10 to the 34 we can't even we don't even know 10 to the what 9 or 16 or something like that forget 34 34 is way out there <laughs> so i mean how does he go blank to 10 to the minus 34 when our basic understanding is still stuck to the 10 to the minus 8 level well part of this was a fit i mean this spectrum from a black body there's a there's a spectrum and you have a curve and then you have to fit it to a function and then you fit it with a multiplier this is the time when there's no calculator there is no nothing you have to do every calculation by hand with slide rule and log with book slide rule. yeah right slide rule and log books he figured this thing out with slide rule and log books that's the genius but he was it. dead on i mean he was like dead on it's amazing that's that's the genius 100 years 120 years ago no computer imagine ask a person today to calculate things without a calculator and they'll be like what i used to teach physics university here and you cannot you cannot challenge if you ask them to multiply 5 times 6 they will face never that skill never got developed because it was not needed but this guy did the whole thing on slide rules and you know even even our voyager was sent to the moon on slide rules on slide rule yeah yeah slide I mean, rule. apollo 13 apollo 13 has this beautiful scene where he says um i've done the math somebody just check my math and he's doing the thing in a freaking slide rule and up in space with freezing conditions my god i think many of the new generation kids must be wondering what's a slide rule what's a slide rule? <laughs> <laughs> yeah No, but so virju what is our understanding so today what do we really understand at what lens scales do we think that okay now we got this we don't know anything beyond that but this we got what is that lens scale well we do have a fair enough uh, understanding at the atomic lens scale reasonable understanding at the uh, atomic lens scale and the chemistry of it like angstrom which is 10 to the minus what meters 10 10, 10. to the minus 10 Yeah, decent. Okay, so Angstrom level. Angstrom level. Angstrom. Angstrom level. Okay. Yeah. Right. Not not a complete understanding, but you know, reasonable understanding. We have we have a good, okay understanding, good understanding. But if you look at the standard model of physics, it's got all kinds of these, all these funny particles that are even. That below comes the... at ten to the minus fifteen, ten to the minus sixteen. That scale. But you're saying that if you don't, if you only master ten to the minus ten, so what the heck do we know about all these other ten to the minus fifteen? That, that's why it's still in a. I mean, standard model is not like it's still a subject of active investigation. There's a hierarchy problem. There's like, why do we have so many? Why do we have three generations? We have you have electrons, leptons, and muons. And why do you have these three types? They are identical, but they are like the mass is hundred, three hundred times or thousand times. Why do we have this mass problem? And why do you have? you know even in the quarks there are all, so we have all these issues like we do not understand the basic structure of it but this is the kind of situation which was in chemistry about in 1850s mendeleev periodic table and all that there was a periodic table and that was related to the atomic structure but nobody at that time you could not figure out how this spdf orbital or whatever you could not fathom that at that time so that is where we are with the quark sub nuclear structure nuclear <laughs> the nuclear level is another it's a mess you know it's a if you try to study the you know the the i was surprised i was shocked when i went uh, i you know growing up uh, you want to do quantum gravity and high energy physics and then you condense matter is for dummies you know that's what the theoretical physics is an ego like oh i i do quantum gravity oh, what is this condensed matter uh, material science and uh, and that arrogance of youth and then you go into nuclear physics concentration first year of uh, msc level fourth year of uh, iit we had a fourth year uh, this was the thing and the first thing we had to study was the condensed matter physics of the nucleus superfluidity right. in the nucleus i'm like what yeah. <laughs> you know and it's like the yeah. first model that you learn about nuclear physics is liquid drop model or, or helium there's something about the helium um no the how does the nucleus hold together that is oh, yeah. just the way same way as a liquid drop so it's a liquid drop model 
you, you okay. put many nucleons and then the, a drop if you put many drops and then at some point the drop breaks so this like the surface tension of the uh, so that was the first model for i think it was for me or somebody because there was the generation you know 100 years ago there was no such division condensed matter or this thing this thing it was all just figure out okay what is happening i want to understand it that's it and then you know with time when it is it is murky it 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 is not it is a very complicated system there is no simple answer there is no simple model you know it's like we understand you know like newtons and the newtons time he solved the two body problem yeah right so so he say okay i i figured out how two bodies move each other then with einstein a little bit further down He said, "Okay, I understand how one body, black hole, is one black. body, yeah. trajectories around the black hole. I I know how that moves." Then you went little further, and you went to the quantum quantum field theory, quantum uh, quantum field theory, and that's where we say, "Okay, we don't understand one body. We figure out the vacuum." <laughs> you tell me how the va- I can tell you how the vacuum to some degree how it works. So it went from two body to one body to now we understand nothing. to some degree but we cannot understand how one body works if you put in a an electron there is infinity in that and you do not know how to explain it there is infinite amount of energy to create an electron is in right. one over r if you just in a very simple term if you say you know one over r is the energy coulomb energy one over right. r r goes to zero is infinity right so but so these length scales the, then when you throw in you throw in uh, not just one electron or one uh, quark or you throw in like gazillions of them you know yeah. then you have no idea what's going on and then that's what the liquid drop model and nuclear physics and it's complicated it's it's hard yeah it's hard right it's but i remember when i was in pune my uh, my atya my dad's sister she sent me on an errand to um to drop off a package to one guy in the uh, ayuka in the university of pune right <clears throat> so i i went there and the guy said okay just hang on i'm going to go run an errand and you just wait in my office so you know at that time i was doing my phd at ncl etc so i thought i i understood mathematics i could understand i could solve for like uh, bessel functions which not many people understand but i understood so i said okay fine So I went to his office and I was sitting there. So as a as a curious guy, I was looking, and then there was some things on his blackboard. You know, in India there was no whiteboard; there it was blackboard, and I could not understand what the heck it was. It was all bloody symbols, this, that, random stuff. And then I just peeped over on his side of the desk, and it was papers with all kinds of stuff written. And so when he when he came back, I said, "What is this?" So he says, "You know, I'm working on." the first two minutes and i said first two minutes of what he says first two minutes after the big bang and i said dude what the heck are you talking about and then he said wait i'll take you for a tour so he took me to uh, the lawns of the ayuka and there was this um, you know how these red borders are there in india on the lawn so there was like series of red borders and he says what are these i said they are borders he says no they are not borders they are the meridians of magnetic uh, 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 how do you say magnetic uh, uh-huh. i don't know what field something at that location so they were the they were the magnetic it was like i was like in a kid in a candy store man it was like amazing to talk to this guy very beautiful campus it's really nice yeah so <clears throat> anyway bridge this has been awesome and i think we can do these um, I, I keep having these questions, and I know you and I we WhatsApp, etc. But I think to get you live like this and just to bounce off some of these questions and you put it into perspective, I mean, this is a this is a really great um, learning for me because it satisfies my left brain stuff. I'm not at the same level of physics as you are for sure, but it's it's a good so thing to the, you know, have this Q and A. It's not the level of it's just the inquisitiveness that matters. It's just the passion that matters and you have ample of that so that's good yeah and uh um, okay so thanks will you and i'll also have i think we'll we'll also 
have this a retreat. I have a retreat which I have for many years. I have been thinking, but I just haven't had time uh, to on contemplating the universe. Like uh, how practically there are two worlds that we live in: meditation and physics. You know, like uh, at that I live in, and and uh, there are there are amazing things about one of them which can you know which which allow one to relax or to to wonder or to uh, to expand the perspective which benefits the other so there are aspects of one which can benefit the other and there are aspects of this world that benefits this one so i have had this in the mind and we will because of this online uh, we are going to very soon we'll have this we'll we'll have a retreat contemplating the universe so mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you don't mind, Virju, I'm going to um, ask the people who are following the Physics of Pranama channel, if they have any specific um, sure. physics related questions, we can collate them and then I'll get you back on another session. Definitely. And then we'll do this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you That's very much. Virju, it was awesome. Huh? I know we've been talking about this for many, um, many months now, but yeah. And YouTube now. channel also now you have. What's that? Do you make a YouTube channel yet or no? Yeah, I have a Physics of Pranayama YouTube channel. Okay, so good. right now it's it's still content light there, but eventually it'll be content heavy. Good. And there are lots of people who are interested in uh, this kind of stuff, and yeah, we gotta we gotta I make want, it real I... for people. Do this again, okay? So thank you, Birju, for you know sparing your time. I know you're super busy with your internship and all this stuff. You're working like a zillion hours and to get out like one hour for just like a random Q and A session. This is really nice. No, oh, it's energizing for me also. No, it's like, I love talking about these things. <laughs> if I have somebody who can hear, then it's like, okay, yes. All right. So thanks, Birju. I'll see you. Thanks. Bye.